Margot Wallström, welcome to Lund and the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. First of all, can you describe your work for the United Nations? Since two years back, I'm the first one to hold a new mandate uh, created by the Security Council and the Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence. And how come this is such a new topic? It should have been there a long time ago, I guess. Because it is nowadays defined as a peace and security issue which belongs on top of the Security Council's agenda. It's a heavy impediment to restoring peace and security anywhere. But I, I think, I guess it should have been there a long time ago. I mean, it was there, in a way it was there already 11 years ago when Resolution 1325 was adopted. And that was the first res resolution that acknowledged that women and men are affected by war and peace in different ways, but that women um, do not have a voice in, in um, restoring or maintaining, creating peace. Uh, and that it was very important to, to, to do something about that. And also mentioned uh, rape as a weapon or tactic of war. And in consecutive resolutions this has been uh, described, better described, and uh, including cr the creation of this mandate a couple of years ago. And if you would describe how big a problem among all problems that occur, occur during war is this with the sexual uh, violence. In every, we know it from history. We know it from every war or conflict from Genghis Khan, uh, it was described in the Bible, to uh, our times. Uh, but it has also been, um, been denoted as history's greatest silence because also in the Nuremberg trials uh, the judge did not want to see any crying woman uh, in the courtroom. Uh, so this has also been not openly recognized as a war crime. It is now, uh, after what happened in the Balkans. We know it from uh, our days, uh, from uh, what happened after the Arab Spring, or during the Arab Spring. We know it now from Mali, from Guinea, from all the situations that are now on the Security Council's agenda actually has an element of, of, of rape. And that is because the changing nature of war and conflict, leaving civilians as the, the majority of the victims and leaving uh, women and children also on the front lines of war. Would you say, I guess it's hard to know, but is this a growing problem? We don't know because we do not have a benchmark. We do not have a possibility to, to, to follow it. I, I think it is um, it is maybe the wep it has become the weapon of choice because uh, um, most wars today are not uh, wars between two, uh, two uh, armies on a battlefield. It is more intrastate state. It's uh, civilian wars and civilians are uh, the, uh, the victims. Uh, and I think this, this affects how you can use this as a very effective and silent and cheap uh, tactic or, or, or weapon of war. And what can you do? We can do, we have lifted it up on and, and we hope we can keep it on top of the Security Council's agenda. That is an open recognition of this as and defining it as um, a, a, a peace and security issue, not, not solely a women's issue. Um, we can uh, engage peacekeepers and train and prepare peacekeepers so that they can be much better in preventing this. We can uh, first uh, and foremost, I would say, do everything to <coughs> end impunity because this has had almost no consequences <coughs> and instead it has uh, led to impun almost total impunity and amnesty for this type of crimes. You said this is not only a women's issue but still, would you say women are more involved in these issues than men? Um, so far, yes, I, I would say they have been maybe more on the advocacy side, more, more women, because they are disproportionately affected by it. Most uh, victims or survivors are uh, still women and, and young girls and children. But we have more and more reports about men and boys also being uh, victims of uh, sexual torture, uh, sexual violence, uh, rapes in detention centers, in prisons, in border crossings uh, everywhere. And I think uh, this is important to mention that, that uh, 
both men and women also can, can be among the survivors. And I, this seems to be a huge problem. Are you optimistic? Do you think you can really make a difference? We can make a difference. We have already made a difference in how, for example, the ICC, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, uh, addresses this, that this is part of the indictments, and we can see it, I hope, uh, the day after tomorrow when Charles Taylor, um, we will see the judgment against Charles Taylor, where this is one element. We see it in uh, how the sanctions committees of uh, the Security Council uh, actually addresses this problem. We can see it that we are now given all the instruments that the Security Council has available to them. Um, and, and that is very, very important. And all this also is a question of wars. Are you, if you will look a, a, into the future, are you optimistic or pessimistic when it comes to the world uh, being more or less violent? I know it's a tough How question. Can, yeah, <laughs> and it's easy to answer maybe with um, some kind of, of, of banality or... But, but are you just optimistic? I, um, I, am, I am a true believer in, in, in breaking sort of the, um, the, the passivity of, of ordinary people. I, I do think that things like the, what we saw in, uh, happening in Oslo actually will mean that, that people uh, wake up and, and also see that they have a, a responsibility. Uh, I, at the moment I find it difficult to say that I'm very optimistic, but, but how can you build on anything else than the fact that women, have a fan, uh, women and men everywhere have a fantastic capacity to but create? But why do you say that you're really not very optimistic? Because I've seen, I think, I've seen the extremes. I've seen how much evil, as if evil has to be recreated every time. I've seen women and, ch and children in particular being subject to so much of cruelty and, and violence and sexual violence and oppression and I don't know what discrimination that I really also have a huge frustration and a huge anger over the situation as it is. But I've also been so encouraged and inspired by what women do. They, they pick their lives up. They have to go on. They just continue fetching water, going to the market, uh, caring for their families. They have to go on. They mm. cannot just lie down and give up. And so that, that, is, that is also the most inspiring thing you can experience. And we've seen a lot of that as well. You've, you've only worked with this for two years. But if you would point on one thing that you're specifically happy with, what would that be? Sounds cruel, but we put people to jail for this kind of crime. And how we important got, is we that, got do you think? Very important because there were no consequences uh, for, for raping a, a woman. And we, we put Maela to in, in prison. We have, we've been to the Security Council and we have now access to everything from visa and travel bans to freezing the assets to making sure that there are sanctions against those that commit these, these terrible crimes. Now this may sound as a leading question, but we are at the Raoul Wallenberg Institute. Would you say you get any inspiration from Raoul Wallenberg in your work? Yeah, because what I, what I hinted at before was really the need for personal courage. Uh, in, in Swedish we say civil courage, and I, I think it's a, it's a great uh, expression. Somebody that actually that people are ready to stick their necks out, to say, yeah, I do take a risk. But or we I see can this very seldom, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we do. And we, we do. So we need people to be inspired by, that it, you can make a difference, that you can actually create something. He, he did that. He invented stuff to be able to, to save uh, uh, the Jews. And I think we see too few of these, these people. And I, um, we need them as a kind of beacons of of a time that is sometimes very, very uh, hard to live in. Some say uh, it's interesting to ask you, because you're Swedish, that he's more famous abroad than in Sweden. You travel that's a lot. True. Would you say that's the case? Oh, absolutely. And I travel, I've traveled myself to uh, places like Hungary. And um, people come up to me and say, oh, you're Swedish. You have to look at our monument. And I, I didn't know until uh, late that what I actually saw from my window, uh, the office window in New York, was uh, a monument for Ralph Wallenberg. But in, in, in Sweden, it is not like that. We do not celebrate him 
in the way they do. Well, it was controversial in those days, and I mean, I'm only learning also that, that kind of history. It was not a given thing that he would be considered. Uh, uh, and I think it had to do with a kind of political climate that, that existed in those days. But because at the same time, it could be a very good PR for Sweden, that the oh, Sweden definitely. was so heroic. It is. I mean, it is. It is not tainted in, in any way uh, abroad, and I think that's... Uh, how we should, of course, use and, and honor his, his memory. But uh, that kind of personal stamina and, and courage and, um, and spine uh, is, is very important. And, of course, it's a fascinating um, human uh, destiny because we, we do not know exactly what, what happened to him in the end. Mm. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you.